So uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you very much. I'm very, very glad to be here and to try to uh, speak a bit about my um, field of research that is a bit peculiar uh, as we will see. Um, specifically, my the aim of my contribution is to give uh, a general and therefore generic overview of the cultures of pre-Roman Central Italy, and in particular uh, of the mechanisms of power and power management. Uh, in order to do this, I will necessarily have to be a bit superficial on many aspects, and I apologize in advance for this. Let's begin with a, a classical map, a map that tries to take a snapshot of Italy before the Roman conquest with all the peoples that you see, the Bolshans, the Sabine, the Umbrians, uh, and so on. Uh, this snapshot uh, is a snapshot of a reality that does not exist. Why? Because we have become increasingly aware that in ancient Italy there was a, an intensity of movement, a strong movement, single individuals, small groups, entire uh, peoples. So the obvious, obviously uh, this implies that there was um, an important cultural exchange and osmosis to, to, to some extent. Uh, and this is something that must be kept in mind. Uh, with regard to the question of power and social systems, it must be said that this is a subject that has been somewhat less emphasized in recent years. I'm showing you here uh, some uh, of the most important um, titles and uh, there is a something that covers a part of the of the, the slide, but not. Anyway, from okay, <laughs> uh, from the old Rosenberg, nineteen thirteen, to the more recent Tessestek of the, of a few years ago. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, so you see, it is part of the most relevant uh, publications on the on the subject. However, um, uh, what I would like to to, to um, to try to do today is uh, to focus on uh, problems mainly. Why? Because the problem is that for the Italian populations, we only have secondary literary sources, Greek and Roman. Then we have important epigraphic production, but with problems, and we will see, and the archeological evidence that's rich, very interesting, but it is not easy to use it in order to understand issues such as social and political structures. Um, to address the theme I have chosen, we can select different levels. The first, quite surprisingly, maybe, we can call it the Italic peoples as a, an Amazonian tribe. What do I mean? Of course, I mean the so-called anthropological approach. Indeed, in some ways, the study of Italic peoples has affinities with those traditionally entrusted to ethnologists and anthropologists. I would like to begin with a, a brilliant anthropologist, Pierre Clast. In his uh, researches in the late 70s, uh, Pierre Clast uh, tried to, to figure out how power in primitive societies uh, did work. Um, you see, taking primitive societies seriously comes down to this proposition, which defines them. A distinct political sphere cannot be isolated from the social sphere. And that's very interesting. But furthermore, those called leaders are stripped of all power. Shift and ship is located outside the exercise of political power. Functionally, it seems absurd. Anyway, uh, it is quite difficult to understand to what extent this kind of, of uh, speculations can be useful for our Samnites and other uh, cultures. In concretely, I think rather less, but it's there is a, a part mm, it's outside. Can I not? It's not possible to 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 see. Yes, behind the bar. Mm, 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 mm. Hi, 
اسمح لي Okay, let's try to move this some time to time. <laughs> okay, so let's let's move forward. Um, what is very interesting in our, for our purpose is this kind of scheme. What is? Herman Service was a, an anthropologist in the 70s, and he tried to divide the societies in four uh, types. Mobile hunters, gatherers, segmentary society, chiefdom, and the state. Um, I'm not going into the detail. You, you see that the differences are um, about the total number, the social organization, the economic organization, settlement patterns, religious, uh, the religious side, and so on. We will com come back to this. Uh, what's important, in my opinion, is that uh, Renfrew and Ban, more recently, uh, used this uh, subdivision in order to try to be helpful for archaeologists. But service categories, as you see here, provide a good framework to help organize our thoughts. Uh, it would be wrong to overemphasize the importance of the four types of society given above and so on. So this is, uh, I think we should uh, think about. In any case, Italic cultures are usually placed between segmentary and chifto, the two central uh, types you see. The dimension, the social organization, it's a segmentary society. It's a kind of, uh, uh, once upon a time, we, have, we, we would have called them, them uh, tribes. Now, nowadays, uh, anthropologists try to avoid this kind of word tribe. The second level, Oh, this is um, it's worth noting, moreover, that in recent decades, various sociological proposals have sprung up to understand the structure of societies. So you see a monarchy, oligarchy, of, of course, but then hierarchy, heterarchy, incorporation, circular hierarchy. I don't think this is quite useful for our purposes, but let's move on. Italic peoples as a proto-historic proto society. In some ways, in fact, we are dealing with societies without literary production, without urban centers, for which often only material culture speaks, just as in proto-historic societies. So it is interesting to recall that in the proto-historic studies, there has been a strong drive for the development of theoretical models from the Pironi school to more recent studies. One of the key themes in the analysis of proto-historic society is the question of urbanization. I will not go into details, but uh, it's useful to recall that there, ha there is a heated debate on the subject, uh, including discussion on the origins of Rome itself. So let's avoid touching on this issue. We can see that the underlying problem is the difficulty in identifying a definition of what we mean by city. The fact is that literary sources point to Italic cultures as lacking cities and civic mentality. For some nice who dwelt in villages among the mountains, they used to ravage the regions of the plain and so on. The nations live generally in villages and, and so on. Of course, it is legitimate to ask to what extent this image is the result of a cliche of the uncivilized barbarians. Precisely, non civis they do not have the city because they are barbarians. Hmm? This leads to the next step, the other side. Why the other side? In respect to the classical one, the Greek and the Roman one. As a matter of fact, the classical world has often portrayed these cultures by building its narrative on a series of positional pairs, city, village, lowland, mountains, agriculture, pastoralism, and so on, writing, no writing, complex or simple societies. The mechanism is uh, quite clear. On the other hand, it is not necessarily the case that all the oppositional elements are really exaggerated. 
for example. The classical image of several of these populations is connected with two elements, war and pastoralism. Now, pastoralism is actually a bit of an exaggeration. Surely, transhumance element was crucial to the economy of ancient Italy. But surveys such as the Sangro Valley, the Biferno Valley, and other projects have shown that there was, in fact, also a considerable amount of agrarian exploitation. After all, there is no such thing as a purely pastoral society. As for the war, <clears throat> here too the image may be emphasized for propaganda reasons, but on the other side, it is also true that the, the same Samnites and other communities of ancient Italy tended to self-represent themselves in this way as warriors. So there is something uh, sound in this uh, image. After all, we know that in these societies, war is a total social fact, to quote Marcel Mauss, very pervasive and intense. We will return to this theme later. And finally, the level we will like most Italic peoples as Italic peoples, which is the most complicated. To try to understand cultures by getting inside them, so to speak, it is necessary to start from the three types of context we have at our disposal, settlements, necropolises, sacred places. This without losing sight of the landscape more generally, the way in which these three elements relate to each other and to the natural context. Settlements. We know of few centers in this uh, area of central Italy that can be qualified as cities. That is a system at the center of a political and social structure, even before being material and special. When we do see them, they are invariably laid. Capestrano, for example, with this, uh, you see here, um, okay. The terraces for the assembly of people, the gathering of people who take part in so, something like political uh, assemblies. But we are speaking of third, second century BC, so quite late. A great example is Satricum. I'm playing in a, in a well known situation here, because Dutch excavations have revealed how this was an important Latin city with the classic separation between, of space for the living and space for the dead. But in the fifth century, Satricum saw a major change with the appearance of a necropolis in the middle of the city. This change, strong change, marks a change in world view presumably connected with the arrival of the Apennine peoples uh, who brought their culture based on villages, presumably the Volscians, and a society made, of, made up of clan-based communities, as is clear from the special analysis of the necropolis. You see a real clan-type clusters, groups of burials. An aspect that brings us back to Renfri urban segmentary society. One of the key themes for understanding the mechanisms of power in pre roman Italy and beyond is the role of the sacred. The sacred, in fact, as a function of ensuring social mechanisms, especially in contexts where the state with its military arm is absent. Amongst the enormous bibliography, at least from Durkheim on, I will just show a passage from a very influential book, Michael Mann, The Sources of Social Power. Mann emphasizes the function of religion as an element in organizing social relations uh, with a sense of collective normative identity and ability to cooperate. A religiously centered culture offers a particular way of organizing social relations. <clears throat> we see this, among other things, in the sanctuaries of pre-Roman Italy, which in some cases perform the function of the absent city. A spectacular example is Pietra Bondante. We are in Molise, a central sanctuary for the Samnites Pentry, with a specific warlike connotation, as is clearly pointed out by the offerings of weapons, often foreign weapons, by this dedication to the goddess Victoria, Vic 
Victurai dunum dedens, you see here, from right to left, Victurai. And the centrality of Pietra Bondante as a cult place, but as well as a political place, is declared by this important inscription that speaks of a sanctuary of the Samnites. It is a Safinim Sarakakulud. Sorry. <laughs> From right to left. What does it mean? It's a, it's a sanctuary of the Safinim, of the whole culture. So we have religion, politics, and war that meet in this place, showing themselves, this, themselves as intertwined things. It cannot be missed that in the meantime, another protagonist of absolute importance has appeared, writing. Again, in the enormous literature, I can recall Jack Goody's fascinating studies, which point out how, how important the use of writing in a society, comparable to changes in the modes of production, as you see. Now we have Michael Crawford's exceptional uh, collection of uh, inscriptions, Italic inscriptions, the three volumes that are really invaluable for, for us. And this table taken by, uh, from uh, Stéphane Bourdin book is very useful because it helps us understand many aspects. Among them is the fact that urban societies, which are more socially, structured are the ones that, not surprisingly, make greater use of writing. The Latins, the Etruscans, the Faliscans. While, on the other side, less urbanized and less complex societies have little use of writing, and only from later times, as you see here, the premier attestations, the sixth, third, sixth, second, fourth, and the numbers eight, one, three, five. For the version, there are two, but it instead is only one, sadly. <laughs> While the Etruscans, you see 10,000 is outdated, it's 13,000 now, uh, and, and so on. So a lot of these uh, peoples start writing late, from later times and after extensive contact with the Greek and the Roman world. If we start looking at the Oscan area, you see here, the Oscan language in this area, we see that there is a rather rich epigraphy, although late, fifth, fourth century on. But here we can see how writing is useful as an indicator of the emergence of forms of community control, so to speak, the Frentani, uh, people in the Molise, between Molise and Puglia, they have coins with their name, Frentrum, but even more interesting, they have weights. On one case, the, the weight is guaranteed by Jupiter, Jupiter Liber. Juveles Lufres is written on the weight. And the others, on the other case, there is the name of the Frentani, the Frentiais, is the official way of the community. Hmm? In this case, religion seems to be lacking, even if this kertum, you see kertum, ker here and tum and the rest, it is usually interpreted, I'll show you in a while here, as uh, established, but ker may also point out to the goddess Ceres, as in all other cases we know in the, in the area of the, the Samnium. But this is not in, interesting for our purposes. Writing is also indication of magistracies. The Oscan area taken broadly is all in all rich. We have, first of all, the term for the populus, the tota. What kind of people, what kind of populus? The populus in arms or the people as a whole, we do not know. But we see here a sacred law, a lix, you see, of the pota marocca, of the community, the people of the marrucini. 
who lived in the, the area of uh, Abruzzo, one of the areas of Abruzzo. Uh, so we see here again the political institution of the Tauta under the religious guidance of the of gods. Britain, yes, in the third century BC, quite late, but it's very interesting. Another interesting thing is the names of the supreme magistracy of the Oscan peoples, the so-called medics. Uh, some scholars say that medics uh, comes from medos, law, and dic, which makes manifest. So it's the, the, the guy who makes manifest the law. We have um, inscriptions from uh, the area of the Marsi, you see the medics, uh, one, a single medics in one case, a couple of medicus in the other case. What kind of power did they have? We don't know. We only know that they, they, they had the, the best, the top um, charge of their community. Back to Pietra Bondante. Here we find the more important medics, the medics tuticus, the medis tutkis. He is the medics of the whole tota, of the whole populus. It is interesting that in this case, the, podium, uh, the, the, the medics marks the podium of the sanctuary. And it is important to note that the unit of measurement of the blocks is the Oscan foot, not the Roman one. Let's move. Pompeii. The Oscan Pompeii. We have here Medices, Medices Tutici, as this guy, this one, who, as you see, had this arc built and, and, and uh, he passed it as completed. There is a problem here. <sighs> Why? Because this kind of formula, a magistrate who had this structure built and passed it as completed, is the same as the Roman one. This is one of the several examples we can, we can have. Pons Fabricius, Lus Fabricius, Faciundum Keravit, Idemque Probavit. It's the same kind of formula. What does it mean? Is it a coincidence or are these Oscan magistra magistrates of the last centuries uh, of the first millennium somehow a copy of the Roman ones? As you see, apart the medics, we have the Aedilis, the Kentstur, the Prefucus, the Pretur, the Quaestur. They really seem to, to be a copy of the Roman ones. And all, every one of this is uh, from the late, Republican times. This is one of the problems. The other problem is this one. Um, too often we forget to take into account variations in time and space. How can we be sure that the medics of the Marsi, villages scattered in the mountains in the third century BC, those in Pompeii, a city from the second, those from Pietra Bondante, the sanctuary had the same function. There are different contexts, different societies, different structures. Power, just like religion and other networks, are not universal phenomena living outside of their social and cultural contexts. Furthermore, it is quite clear that in the Oscan area, the close contact with the Greek and Roman cultures resulted in a strong influence on titles and presumably on the nature of power as well. Let's turn now to another area, the Adriatic area for a story of ankles. The area between Marchi and Abruzzo has offered uh, several important novelties in recent decades. This uh, map by Enrico Benelli uh, show is an, an, an excellent overview of the archeological and linguistical fasces of this area. What is striking about this area is the rarity of places of worship and even more so of center with urban ambitions. Instead, necropolis, often monumental and well-structured, play a central role. 
In necropolis in the Abruzzo area, such as Opi, Bazzano, Fossa, we find again the clan structure, as already in Satricum, an indication of a segmentary society, you will remember from the beginning. Um, Furthermore, we have elements to say that in these cemeteries, ritual performances took place. So we can imagine gathering of peoples as well. You see the groups, the clusters of tombs as a sign of the clan society, social structure. The funerary landscape of this area was marked by stele, sometimes anthropomorphic. This is one of the most intriguing is uh, two meters high, quite anthropomorphic, and uh, with a very interesting inscription. This is the so-called uh, South Pisin language. It's not clear at all, but we can grasp here and there some words, some uh, something very useful for uh, for us. In this case, we are in the fifth century BC. You see um, the, propose, the, trans, the proposed translation by Michael Crawford, a, a huge amount of question marks, but something we can see. There is a tota again, so the community, the tota of the Safin people, the tribe, and um, a monument erected to a man, this one we presume, in respect of what you have achieved, a monument of your deeds. So this is not the monument erected by a family or a clan, but by a wider social group, the Tolta, hmm? a possible indication of the character wide role. It's funerary, of course, but in the meantime, it is uh, something that comes from a, a, a wide group, a wide society, the tota. And the other thing that is very important is the, the reason for this monument, the deeds, what you have achieved. Again, here, the Safina, the Tota, and so on. And here, another South Paisin inscription. A Pais Kupa in Pupunis Nir Mefin Veya, and so on. Nir is the key word here. Because it, it is translated as hero. Why? Because we have uh, literary sources according to which Nero in, in the Sabine language means fortis, strenuos. We thus have characters whose collective value is recognized and connected to individual dates. The most striking case is a bit further south. It is the Capestrano warrior. Again, two meters high. We are speaking of um, huge statue discovered in the 30s, 1930s, extraordinary. A standing male figure in military costume, the head is covered by a disc-shaped parade helmet, has a mask over the face, the chest is protected by metal discs, the warrior carries a sword with decorated hilt and scabbard, and a dagger. On the right, he holds a small axe. The ornaments are necklace, pandan, bracelets, he was not alone. There was also a lady of Capestrano, about whom we can say a little. And the twin, who is a bit of a problem because he appeared quite suddenly at an auction in London. And some scholars say that it's a fake, quite possibly a fake. The, the problem is that there is an inscription on one of the pillars. The key word here is this raki or raki nevi. Why? Because some scholars say that it can be uh, the word for rex, raki. I don't think so. 
I, sh I share Michael Crawford's uh, skepticism. Whatever Reiki may mean, it can have nothing to do with Rex. The only thing the two words have in common is that both begin with R. Tranchant, Michael Crawford, as, is, as usual. In any case, Rex or not Rex, what is sure is that we have uh, an exceptional uh, figure. This is clear. And the, the objects of his um, decoration recall clearly were the, not only the, the sword and the, the, the knife, but this kind of uh, cuirass you see here. We find precisely the same kind of object in tombs and so and so and so on. Um, the cuirass disc, by the way, we find in the uh, end of seventh, sixth century BC. And it's quite strange, quite surprising to see this kind of object in the fellows of Romulus, a bit out of place, if you think, a chronological side of the, the ma matter. And the axe. The axe is a symbol of power. We'll come on this. The discs, we are speaking of the discs. We know several of them all uh, throughout central Italy, often with interesting decoration depicting scenes that seem to allude to myths or something like that. A call into play human beings, warriors, more or less fantastic animals. Um, the case of the recently discovered sceptres of Spoleto, you see here, three exceptional uh, documents, it's extraordinary. They are halves forged in cutout technique in iron and then in bronze cast onto the shell. You see men, warriors, uh, fantastic animals. The mythical role of this scepter is associated, of course, to his uh, symbolic value. Is a scepter, like the one in Matelica and others, is a symbol of power. What kind of power? We don't know, but it means something. This kind of um, mythological level of men, warriors, and uh, fantastic animals uh, calls, recalls to my mind mm, one of the few traditions we know for our italics, a very suggestive one, the so called Ver Sacrum. What is a Ver Sacrum? Put it shortly. The Versagum uh, appears as a practice consisting in a, in a vow, a votum, to a god or the whole generation of offspring born in the spring of the following year to humans or cattle, who, when grew up, grown up, would have moved to another country. Under the guidance of a leader, a human leader, or an animal representing the god. In these traditions, we see as protagonists animals. Indeed, the tradition of the Italic peoples often involve animals that would have been called totemic, is a word that nowadays anthropologists dislike rather. They see the Irpini from the Hirpus, the, 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 the wolf, the Lucani as well, the Piceni from the Picus, the woodpecker, uh, the Samnites had as a totem the bull. This is not a crocodile, this is a, the she-wolf she of the Romans, the symbol of Romans, you know, this, this uh, uh, coin. And we have the human leaders. Sometimes we do have the names, Stenius Metius, Cominius Castronius, hmm? whose names have in some cases been preserved, figures around whom a mythical tradition seems to have been built. Let's return for a moment to our warrior, because his story is not yet over. We can imagine that he was originally placed on a burial mound. This is Hirschlanden in Germany, so just to give you a, a, an idea of the, 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 the situation. What's strange is that the warrior in the 30s was found in pieces scattered around the burial area. You see the detail of the ankles broken. 
It suggests that the statue had been violently knocked down already in ancient times. This reminds of uh, nowadays political upheavals uh, uh, and possibly of ancient upheavals of which we are obviously totally unaware. We can only conjure up these kind of scenes. At the very least, it is a further indication of the political importance of these figures. A similar situation are not lacking. This is the tomb 36 from Colle del Forno, we are in the Sabine area. It was a, an incredibly rich tomb with a dromos, with a corridor, with a 26 meters long, uh, a number of chambers, uh, with uh, horses sacrificed, a lot of richness in this kind of uh, tomb. Uh, objects whose symbolic value are very, is very, very clear. And then, shortly after the burial, the tomb was reopened and the contents were ransacked and for the most part violently destroyed. The wooden box containing the ashes of the deceased, wrapped in gold cloth, was broken to the ground, not stolen, just destroyed, left there, violently destroyed. The weapons smashed to pieces, almost all the material was destroyed, except for the throne. What happened, of course, we don't know, but uh, in any case, the political significance of the tomb is very strong. Now, I would like to, to close my, my talk, asking help from some very good books to draw some conclusions. This is a very well-known book, Anthony Smith, The Ethnic Origins of Nations, 1986. There is much more to the concept of nation than myths and memories, but they constitute a sine qua non. There can be no identity without memory, albeit selective. No collective purpose without myth. Identity, purpose, or destiny are necessary elements of the very concept of a nation. And the nation, after all, can be simply an, an enlarged ethnic community. Ethnicity is a mythic and symbolic in character and, and so on. Paul Connerton, How Societies Remember, 1989. Concerning social memory in particular, we may note that images of the past commonly legitimate a present social order. Participants in any social order must presuppose a shared memory. Our experience of the present largely depend on knowledge of the past. Our images of the past commonly serve to legitimate a present social order. And yet, these points, stand insufficient. Images of the past, I call knowledge of the past, are conveyed and sustained by performances. If there is such a thing as a social memory, we are likely to find it in commemorative ceremonies, but commemorative ceremonies prove to be commemorative only in so far as they are performative. Just remember the funeral, the gathering of people in the funerary areas in, in Abruzzo, performative. And Zerubabel, ancestors and relatives. Relatedness is not a biological given, it's a social constructed in accordance with certain social cognitive conventions and so on. Such conventions are based on particular norms of remembering, forgetting, destroying, classifying people as well as other organisms. Not only does our genealogical vision of co-descent help connect in our minds various relatives, it also seems to provide the mental, mental cement necessary for constructing actual communities. It also constitutes a formidable basis for group formation. Ancestry and descent play a critical role in the way that we structure the transmission of both material and symbolic forms of capital. We are speaking here of the, not only the, the role, but the inheritance, the land ownership were transmitted through uh, lineage. Essentially based on rather vague, blah, blah, blah. Um, the clan or the group of clans, we could call tribe, the most common communities are ethnic groups 
fundamentally past-oriented communities, whose members claim common descent, despite the fact that it's very often only presumed. And the, only, the, the last one, of course, if we speak of power, we cannot avoid speaking of Michel Foucault. The state can only operate on the basis of other already existing power relations. The state is super, super structural in relation to a whole series of power networks, that's the body, sexuality, the family, kinship, knowledge, technology. We have spoken exactly of this, the power relation. So what I'm, just to conclude, um, Keywords here are ethnicity, nationhood as symbolic, mythical elements. Myth in these cultures is not like the Greek idea of myth. It seems rather connected with the ancestral recent past. It's memory on which society and its mechanisms are built. Lineage, authority, legitimation of power, land ownership, inheritance. The problem remains. Basically, our documentation is either an expression of another point of view, Greek and Roman, or it is of such a nature that it makes it difficult to understand complex mechanisms such as those governing power in non-state society. What we do in effect is to look at these societies through the keyhole. On the other hand, a combination of analysis on the available documents, their insertion into solid but flexible conceptual frameworks and confrontation with our other disciplines, anthropology, but not only, can perhaps help us to give back some voices to these cultures that with a bit of exaggeration, I have called voiceless. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Massimiliano, for giving these uh, italic tribes, as italic tribes, uh, their voices. Uh, and by combining different perspectives from other disciplines, uh, anthropology, sociology, uh, and uh, yeah, seeing them hopefully as they were. Um, I'm sure there are questions or remarks from the audience, either here in the room or uh, at home. Uh, at home, you can uh, easily speak up or otherwise uh, mention something in the chat if you want. Who can I give the floor? Jeremia. Yes, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, which I en enjoyed uh, very much. I, I was especially um, intrigued by this dichotomy scheme you make, right? Between indigenous italic people versus Greek and, and Roman one. Um, I was actually wondering, where where do you place Rome in this, in this uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, and, and let's not include Rome of the second century because uh, uh, but let's let's focus on the fifth fourth and perhaps the early third century where in this uh, scheme or <laughs> columns would you place Rome and how does it compare in terms of literature literature coinage urbanism uh, from a pure purely uh, empirical perspective. I would be curious to see how different that, that, <laughs> that, that, that picture is. Uh, thank you very much. This is um, a nice question that opens up a lot of uh, discussion, another uh, conference. Um, we need to take into account that the caveat of uh, Renfri Urban, we do not need to look for uh, uh, this um, scheme, let's say, it would be wrong to assume that societies inevitably evolve and we don't need to push societies inside this four uh, types. Uh, clearly, uh, we know uh, ancient Italy uh, is a uh, in Italy of uh, different speeds. There is an, an area that looks a bit more fast, hmm? the Tyrrhenian area. 
so the Etruscans, the Latins, uh, the Campanian area, uh, the Veneto as well. Veneto is really uh, precocious as, a, as far as uh, breathing, uh, urbanism, a lot of things are concerned. Um, and then there is the whole rest of Italy, Apennine, Adriatic Italy, uh, who looks a bit slower. This doesn't mean they are barbarians uh, underdeveloped. They simply have different choices in response to their different environment and a lot of things. If you think of how difficult it is to have um, a clear idea of what, what urban, proto-urban, pre-urban is, all, all the, the debates on the, the, the first centuries of, uh, of Rome, uh, I believe that sometimes um, labels we tend to use are, uh, can be misleading. I must confess, I, I'm a bit obsessed with labels or words. I would always try to ask why we, we use this kind of, instead of that kind of, the Rex. Rex is not a, a, a neutral word. It's the gentilicial society. There is no gens in, uh, in Abruzzo area. Like, like clans, possibly. When we speak of Rome, of course, uh, our problem is that we are strongly conditioned by the late perspective, late Republican and so on, I think, because it's the perspective of the sources, the literary sources. It would be interesting to, to try an experiment, to try to reconstruct early Rome without literary sources at all. There are part. No Cicero, no Livy, no, no nothing, only, Archaeology and inscriptions will be a very interesting game. That's what we always do with the Flascans, with, with these uh, cultures. Yeah, because how many inscriptions of the fourth and fifth centuries do we have? <laughs> so in the in the table that you showed, I think Rome would be among the the those with with very low scores. Well, uh, it's, it takes into account um, all the Republican. At times, so it's, uh, the number is not. Uh, but if you yes, if we cut in the first centuries, uh, there's nothing. Yes, uh, 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 it's it, it looks an, an Etruscan city, as a matter of fact. Yeah, we do have more Etruscan inscriptions than than, than Latin. Yes, but 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 very little. Uh, there's no coinage, no historiography. Uh, so so in in, in in a certain sense, uh, if, if we would want to make a real comparison, uh, mm -hmm. we should do it on equal ground, and especially considering, of course, this very rich research history that has tried to look for this evidence, if we take that into account. I think it would be interesting. Uh, yeah, <laughs> experiment. Oh. oh, sorry, I have to talk in the microphone, <laughs> yeah. otherwise nobody at all. <laughs> Just an extra comment. Uh, I'm happy to pass the mic. Yes, to whom can I pass the microphone for another question or remark? Yes. And In, indeed, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. This is uh, an extremely interesting talk. It's it's. Um, I, I myself am am working on the nature of uh, early Roman imperialism, so in the fourth century, um, which is very much based on this uh, sort of the relationship between state and family, mm -hmm. state and elite, state and, and lineage. Um, so I'm wondering uh, what your opinion would be um, in for these Italic peoples um, if social structures are, um, how do they relate to the state? Is the state dominant? Are families more important? Um, it's maybe a massive question, but uh, I'm very curious about your thoughts. You mean in this area? Yes. In the area, there is no state at all. The, the, the whole society is based on a clan lineage and uh, that's all. It's not um, so simple in any case. Because if we go back to um, Pierre Clastre, how do you uh, manage your power? How do you obtain your power when there is no state? Why you are the leader? 
because of your sorry back and forth for your deeds your achievements because you are stronger braver possibly but of course today you are stronger you are braver tomorrow <laughs> you are thrown you fall so it's a power that is quite a, a complex uh, relationship of um, personal skills uh, charisma and so on and it is a matter of clans of huge groups but ancient rome was to a certain extent not so different nicolas de terrenato's book is very interesting in, in this uh, respect the only thing is that as um, like uh, michel foucault used to say in the roman case we have the state above the clans the, the families and the, a lot of networks in this case we have societies that are small the demography is small they are not huge uh, um, societies huge communities so we don't see a state but uh, again if you don't take into account the literary source, sources how do you say how, how do you know we have a res publica in rome but surely there are some institutions that we would link to a state like for instance priesthoods or because uh, we have these these sanctuaries these uh, yes these sacred sites later <laughs> those are all later Sorry, or those are all later, or uh, how no? In, in Rome, I, um, I was saying in Rome. No, I, I mean also in, um, for instance, Samnite areas or yes. Etruscans. Mm. So, is, is, should we see that as a sort of proto-state or a lead up to a state? Or <laughs> we go back to. Sorry, again, this one uh, is a. They are all models. They can tell us how to organize our thoughts. But concretely, the, the evidence we have is so scattered, so unclear. We are in a dark room. We only touch something we, we, we cannot see. So we, ha we have on one side tombs, some inscription, and on the other side, this kind of theoretical model. The most important thing we, we need to do is to remember and never forget that these are only our models or our frameworks. Thank you. Other questions, remarks? Sir? Ah, okay. Uh, I, I had it. Oh, sorry, Anita. I'll go. Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, following up from your last remark, actually, I was wondering if uh, uh, it is possible to make a categorization based on, yeah, more emic approach, or, and if uh, that will be different from the Renfrew and Ban scheme. Hmm. You see what what kind of um, uh, of aspect this emic perspective uh, where? No, uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, when I was looking at your scheme, uh, not the Renfrew and Band. Oh uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, if uh, would be possible to uh, variate it if we use another. Perspective, the, the emic approach. Huh. I don't know. Emic and ethic uh, are very useful approaches. In, uh, in, um, as far as we, they are helpful to um, remember what kind of um, distance there is between us and the, the subject of study. 
if you think in, uh, in our case, in the societies of pre-Roman Italy, we, the, the things are a bit more complicated because there is not only emic and ethic, there is a third intermediate level. Because if, if I want to try to understand some nights, abortions, and so on, I need to take into account literary sources. A, a kind of intermediate level between the emic and the ethic level. So things are a, a bit more complicated because I need to ask why Levy writes something. What kind of sources did he have uh, in mind? Uh, so it's, it's not easy. Of course, the anthropological uh, perspective can be very useful for us. The risk is that we tend to consider really uh, Italian peoples as an Amazonian tribe. So a bit too simple. Those, those some night leaders were not so Amazonian. <laughs> we all due respect with the Amazonians, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And in the meantime, so if people at home have questions, we don't see the chat here, probably Angelo does, but you can also speak up. Um, I was wondering, actually, in the con context of our uh, course on myth and imperialism, uh, and also towards the end, as you explained, that for, let's say, identity formation, memory and myth are very important. Uh, and uh, I was wondering, because some of the examples of the uh, inscriptions you showed us, they weren't, let's say, about the mythical past, and they didn't actually sort of uh, emphasize specific virtues. And I think that this is what we see uh, in these days, but it is more, much more about human heroes and uh, achievements. So um, I was wondering to what extent do myths come into play uh, in the sources uh, also because uh, maybe the myths or the, the gods would also offer a connection with the other peoples. So it seems that mm -hmm. those are also connecting force forces in this constantly changing Italy that you showed us in the beginning. So I was wondering, maybe can you say something about sort of the mythological uh, aspect of this uh, this image or of the sources. <clears throat> yes, of course. Um, if you do not have any literacy, any literature, it's quite difficult to have to propose to our, your community uh, a tradition that is particularly ancient. You don't have the past. Or to better say that your past is a, a bit short, tends to shorten. So it's the ancestor. It cannot be Aeneas mm -hmm. because there is no literature, there is no um, um, not the um, cultural support for that, I would say. In the meantime, what is our problem is that when we read here the Safin, the tooth of the Safin, who were the Safin? They were a huge community made of single local tribes. What was their relationship? Renfrew and Ban explained that segmentary society sometimes is a pan-tribal association. So small groups bound together by what? Possibly by a common leader in the in the past, not in the distant past. Mm -hmm. And this becomes a, a, a means of communication in the end. We are suffering because we recognize ourselves around a story. The story of the Bersacum, for example, of this, uh, mythical stories of this kind. Uh, on the other side, we are tribes, we are groups, each with its own autonomy, identity, and so on. Um, looking for that. Okay. Yeah. So again, we do not know exactly how 
this relationship between groups, different groups worked. But we can guess, we can imagine that this kind of stories, the stories we see in the, um, for example, the, the here, in this Poleto catalogs, uh, they are not decorations, purely decorations. There is some, some story, something like the like. We cannot understand, of course, but there is something. Uh, Shall we call it a myth? Shall we call it a, a, a story, a traditional story? It's up to you to choose the, 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 the word. It's not my, my business. It's not important to, 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 to speak of myth. Uh, myth is one of this label that can be misleading. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to, to imply a dichotomy between history exactly. And, exactly. and sort of the, the legendary us. world. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's a cultural... Um, Factor of mm -hmm. strong impact. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I have been notified that there may be a question from Tessa. Do you want to uh, uh, speak up and, and ask something? Hello. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Liara. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah? Maybe a little bit louder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> um, thank you for your wonderful lecture. But uh, which was, of course, uh, extremely interesting uh, to hear your ideas about this. Um, I was wondering, um, I've actually, actually two questions. Um, the first, um, you are very, um, let's say, uh, skeptical of the, on the state aspect, the statal aspect of some uh, italic um, communities. Um, and I wonder um, to what extent you think that, um, for instance, the Safinim groups may have um, organized together in the uh, in the face of uh, expanding Rome, uh, expanding Rome power, and um, at which point you would say that there perhaps is indeed a coagulation of, um, of, of groups into one, well, perhaps not state, but at least other organization. Um, and the second question is, um, what do you think um, should we look for now to understand these societies better? So what is our holy grail? What type of evidence do we need to bring the discussion further? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's begin from the first question. Um, I think we um, we have seen today two different uh, situations: the Oscan Campania, Samnium, uh, the more southern uh, and later situation, and the uh, Pison, uh, Vestini, and uh, I. I try to avoid using ethnic labels. If you noticed, because these ethnic labels are uh, Roman, basically. So yeah, I'm trying to speak of uh, societies, tribes, the place. But if we start speaking of Pisons, Vestini, uh, Samnites, uh, we go into a, a game that is a Roman game, basically. And then it's a game of, uh, it's, it's a, a matter of imperialism. As a matter of fact, we have a few cases of the so-called autonyms. What does it mean? The, the autonym is the way in which I call myself as a, uh, as a people. As opposed, I'm trying to, oh, this was before, sorry. Opposed to uh, the ethronym. That is the way in which the others call me. Hmm? Okay, the, the Frentani here, they express their identity. Okay, but it's a, a quite a late expression. In most cases, we do not know how the, those peoples call themselves. And sometimes we can, we, we may wonder, did they really have a common name is not so given for granted. Because if we are tribes here with the aptitude of moving, it's not necessary that we have a specific name. 
name is useful for the Roman perspective because I, I need to know who they are, where they are, and to nail them to a territory in some case. Because they are the enemies. They are, I need to control them. So I need to have a, a, a name, a label for them. Hmm? Uh, so uh, when we see the Oscan situation, we could speak of a state because we perceive, uh, I'm speaking to, 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 to the sky, to the I say is, <laughs> everywhere. Um, I, can hear you. I can hear you well. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, we can perceive a kind of uh, social and political structure, the effort of this pantry or the some nights to uh, organize themselves, not by chance, in the moment in which their military effort was at its top. It's not by chance that all these magistracies, the Medicis and so on, we have seen, belong to the last centuries and not by chance they look quite similar to the Roman ones. A kind of copy. On the other side, when we move towards the Adriatic area and back in time, sixth, fifth century, I think we see another, a, a different situation in which the main magistracy is a total, is a collective, not an individual magistracy. And so here, I'm quite skeptical about the, the presence of a state. Of course, and this is the punctum dolens, we always have to decide what we intend for state. And this is, if we give um, a definition that is a broad, a fuzzy definition, we may say, yes, they have state, they have some kind of organization. If we choose a more precise, more sociological um, definition, I would have, a bit of problems in, uh, in speaking of, of state of the these peoples in the sixth and fifth centuries. We we see a, a fluid situation changing from place to place. It's not easy to find um, a common um, scheme, so this is quite um, difficult. And the other question was the Holy Grail. <laughs> well, uh, if I Think at how what what we did know about the Abruzzo twenty years ago. Our knowledge was extremely less detailed than today. In um, twenty years, new discoveries, new new excavations have given a new a new image to this uh, region of Abruzzo. So new excavations, new inscriptions, um, and most of all, I think, a new way of seeing things from different perspectives, calling into play anthropology, sociology, uh, with the due respect, with due, with, with all the care, the, the, the care of the case. Hopefully, this is uh, uh, the way we can try to 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 improve our knowledge. Thank you. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions here in the room or at home? Yes, Jens? So, yeah, to continue on the whole state thing, <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering what leads you to uh, conclude that there's no state from this inscription because it looks a lot like things we also find in ancient Athens, where they're uh, commemorating heroic people, but they're not very specific. And also, why should there be a very strong dichotomy between a state and a tribal group? Is the state not a sort of sedation of a 
it, it kind of forms itself slowly after travel groups come together? Yes, again, it's a matter of definition. What do we tend for state? If, we, if the state is something extremely organized in which you cannot think at uh, an, uh, an individual experience of, uh, in, in Athens we have, it, in the history of Athens, we have, we know uh, tyrannical experiences. Is that the state, is that inside the state against the state? Is How does it re relate to the state? And in Athens, above all, we have a social structure that we know well, knowledge, our knowledge makes difference, of course, but it's quite clear. In such area, um, it's not nothing personal. I'm not trying to 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 blame them. It's not nothing nothing personal. I will be happy to to to, to recognize that there was a state and literature, a Python literature. But I will be very happy. But we do not see, and um, oh, above all, mm, what looks like is that they didn't need to have a more uh, complex structural society. This is what they, what was enough for their needs. Just like the city. If you live in the Grand Sasso on the mountains, you do not, do not need a city. The village is what fits best for its, for your needs. So it's not a kind of, uh, if we say they had no state, no city, so they were barbarians. No, they simply had a different uh, response to the context. That's that's all. So sometimes the problem is that we can be pushed to to think they had no no state, no city. Uh, in a recent book um, on the Sam Nights, uh, Tessie knows there is a, a a scholar who tried to emphasize that Sam Nights had cities from an earlier stage. Looks like he was trying to uh, redeem the Samnites from this uh, charge of being barbarians. There is no need, simply. They could be perfectly uh, well structured, powerful, um, without having a city. That's all. And we go back to the definition matter. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, just to tap on uh, onto this, so there's also the risk that we interpret uh, um, empirical evidence differently because we use models, right? Yes. So, for example, a lot of the inscriptions that you are uh, showing to us talk about the Safini mm -hmm. Semites, but here we decide to interpret this terms. You yourself said, well, they don't didn't have a name, they don't have an overarching structure. So we, 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 we tend to interpret this differently. So this is not uh, referring to an organized state that is putting up a monument for its ruler. Right? Mm -hmm. But we are... We are ruler or, yeah, yes, well, you, you could... Man. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we just walk uh, past the, the last guest day and basically it's the same, same phrase here. Eh? The people are the, are, who are so thankful for the deeds of this great leader yes, yeah, of course. Uh, yes. uh, put up uh, a monument or the Arapakis. So, but here we, we have a similar formulation, but we interpret it quite differently. So the Safini now are this more vague identity group we we I so I'm not saying <laughs> that they are a state mm -hmm. I, I was saying that there is a risk of um, interpreting the evidence in already fixed models and that in that in that sense the holy grail will never be found because if we find a a, a large comitium somewhere in in in, <laughs> in, in, in the vesti area we would interpret it perhaps as this temporary place where a theatrical religious festival would have taken place. So there's always the difficulty of the relation between the model and the empirical evidence is really difficult, I think, to, to bridge uh, from this archaeology. Yes, absolutely. This, of course, works on one side on, and on the other side of the, 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 the question. Yes, absolutely, yes. Um, again, I, I, I quote, I'm free Urban. These are frameworks to help organize our thoughts, but uh, we do not have to take them as a 
too rigid. And above all, we do not have to try to push our evidence inside these uh, models, of course. Yes. On the other side, if we have, haven't discovered yet uh, a commissium in this area, maybe something <laughs> means. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think it's also very uh, helpful to, let's say, reminding us also the agenda of scholars. So what they want with their topics and why, for example, the, someone would want them to have cities uh, while others would say they have don't, don't have them yet. So not yet. So the also the, the perspective of what you want from your topic and, and what it should resemble uh, is, I think, the, the other risk. Um, yes. If there are no further questions here, yeah, there there are a few. Oh, this is well, the, the questions come loose now. So uh, a few minutes. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the very fascinating uh, presentation. Um, I was very interesting by this um, proof that there was a destruction on these monuments and that these can also uh, disclose perhaps the power of these monuments. Um, I was especially wondering with this temple where you mentioned exactly here, the where the goods were destroyed. Tomb, I say, say tomb. The tomb, tomb. Yes, yeah, yes. sorry. The, the tomb. I want these goods that were in the tomb, they were covered up, they were not visible, right? If I understood correctly. No, um, one of the, um, yeah, the, the, there was a box with the ashes of the deceased. Yeah. It was wrapped up. And this was destroyed. Yes, I, I, I'll just like uh, almost everything. And almost every, but yes, all of these objects were concealed within the tomb. Yes, not yes, visible. yes. So I want so it's, it was reopened yes. shortly after the, 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 the because so. I understand that the statues, for example, where you said these statues are on the top of the tomb, they are very visible. That yes, they go there and destroy it. Yes. I wonder where they're destroying these objects that are within the tomb. If it shows also if these objects are more than just images of power, but they're really objects of power. They're where power also resides for these clans. Yes. Uh, we are speaking of different societies here. Mm. On one side is a Pisin, and then the other side, the Sabines. Um, this tomb was extremely rich. We can presume it was visible was not simply buried. Usually this kind of, uh, even if this particular tomb was exceptional, even in this, in his um, appearance, it's an exceptional structure, but extremely likely that it, it was visible. The problem is that we do not exactly know the tomb of the warrior, for example. There was a tomb because the statue was found uh, scattered in an area of Nicopolis. We may um, try to understand whose tomb was uh, be belonged to the, 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 the of the uh, uh, to the to the warrior, but we do not know what the conditions were. For example, we don't know if the the the, the, the grave goods were were destroyed as well. For example. So we, we, we miss a piece of the, the, the whole information. Um, of course, what is interesting in here in Colle del Forno is that everything was destroyed except for the most interesting symbol of power, the throne. Why? I don't know, <laughs> it is quite interesting. They destroyed everything. The cinerary, the, the, the weapons, uh, not this. Just clay, it's easy to, 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 to break. It's, um, very, we do have a whole series of uh, stories, intriguing stories. Um, we don't understand completely. We can look at them, we can uh, reconstruct archeologically, and then we try to figure out what kind of uh, social system is this one that changes so fast, so uh, violently? This is what we can, we can try to do. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and I think for our last question to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, well, so uh, thank you for the lecture. I thought it was very interesting. Um, I may be going a little bit back into the state territory of things, um, but I was uh, caught on the the use of the tuta and all the inscriptions and uh, tuta. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and how you speak of um, still like societies uh, operating, but also uh, different um, tribes and settlements uh, interacting under a sort of a a common um, uh, goal, and I was uh, curious about. Um, could you speak of uh, like networks existing uh, between uh, on smaller levels or on larger scale levels? Uh, because there are similarities in, for example, language, but also with the graph of the uh, epigraphic uh, evidence, there's still like very large differences in the quantities that are found. Hmm. Uh, well, uh, the South Paisin inscriptions are. Uh less than 20 just to to, to give you a, a, a numerical uh, idea scattered on a, a quite a, a huge territory by the way this is a, another strong indicator of uh, power because not everyone in a community could have a tomb with an inscription even because the quantity of people Capable of reading was, I think, very, very, very. Sometimes the, the writing is more, uh, I have to say, something that strikes as a sign, as a, something aesthetical, more than something that you you can you can read. And. The tota, the tota is um, something different. If we look in the area of the Marrucini, and if we look in the area of the Pisons, there are two two centuries of difference. Um, and as usual, we try to figure out a model. An interpretive model we try to apply because we see there is a tote of the staff in here so something of a co collective uh, um, dimension as I, as I told before we not even know what kind of populus was that the whole community men women children only the the, the men in arms so the warriors, we do not know. So there is some, so many things that we, we ignore that you will, would ask me, so why, why are you speaking of this kind of things today? Because in the wide ignorance we, we, we have, there are some scraps here and there that are worth being collected and try to sell something from, from them. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that what you gave us was indeed in part a reassuring uh, story about what pieces we can gather and how maybe we cannot find the holy grail, but that the route we're on uh, seems to give new evidence and to, to enlarge this picture. Uh, I wanted to thank you also very much because I think it's a really good example of what we aim for with our research dialogues to give a presentation, but also to elicit uh, a lively discussion on what you presented here on the evidence and how we can look at it. So thank you very much again for that. And before we say goodbye to the people at home, uh, I wanted to remind the audience here and at home that we have another research dialogue coming up in a month on the 12th of April by Roberto Biazillo on the ecologies of Italian colonialism, fascist enterprises in North and East Africa. And after that, we will have two other research dialogues in May and June for which you're all uh, invited. Uh, indeed, for now, we have to say goodbye to the people at home. We will continue our discussion here over drinks uh, and hope to see each other uh, soon again. Thank you very much. <laughs>